It's always more challenging to hit a moving target, especially in science. By the time you write a book or do a summary video, there's more to add, which is why after a few dozen episodes in the 2019 playlist, we had to make a full film on the disaster. But by the time it was done, dozens more papers needed to go into the mix, and we chased for another year, and again this year as well. The goal is tracking the ongoing geomagnetic shift of Earth. The magnetic poles are shifting. This is bad news for the creatures that live on this planet. And indeed, we see evidence of an ongoing solar system shift with the other planets, the sun, and even interplanetary space changing, as well as the nearby stars we'd expect to have been recently triggered by a larger galactic shift. It's all about chasing the next iteration of a disaster cycle, and tragically, with all the events and of all the times to be alive, we are about to endure the big one, 12,000 years. Here, we have compiled clips from the full disaster film in 2019, all three existing postludes, the important geomagnetic update from earlier this month, a fourth postlude we will do right in sequence, followed by three bonus clips that all go together with the rest of this material. It's not Hollywood cinematic quality, but the storyline is way more interesting than what they've got, and it's real, with us cast as the lead characters. Here's the script in a little over 90 minutes. Let's begin with the clips from the full film in 2019, Cosmic Disaster, CIA Classified. I'm going to tell you the scariest true story ever told. Over thousands of years, in thousands of versions, with different names and minute details, but the story always ends the same way, with the next end of the world. We'll give you the short version first, and then the burden of proof will fall here to present the evidence across time and topic that the slow crawl of geology, the wind, water, fire, and tectonic creep is punctuated in rare occasions by disastrous upheaval. The Earth's magnetic field reverses, with dramatic excursion events sprinkled between. They can occur in less than 100 years from plunge to rock bottom. Earth's ongoing magnetic event has already been underway 150 years, into the red zone, and it is speeding up. In early 2019, the magnetic event accelerated to where an update to the world magnetic model was required ahead of schedule for the first time. Well, so far, this has not been causing catastrophic events, but unfortunately there are other aspects to the event coming. Both in physical evidence and in the stories told in rock and voice, the sun plays the role of the destroyer. Where the decadal and centennial cycles of activity converge, we find the entire magnetic potential of the sun accessible for what can only be described as a micronova. As unbelievable as that might sound, the evidence will actually show this to be an almost unavoidable consequence of the solar system trip through the galaxy. There is evidence that the crust and mantle unlock at the low velocity zone. The plates collide and may be worse, triggering volcanoes and sending unfathomable amounts of water into the land creating surge deposits of bone and earth. The earthquakes and volcanoes and tsunamis are followed by snow, ice, incredible amounts falling by the yard as Earth's temperature plummets. We'll see evidence at the micro scale of the previous great solar blast, the ways in which humans survived the last great catastrophe, the evidence that similar plans are secretly unfolding beneath our feet, and the evidence demonstrating the cover-up and erroneous geological science that overthrew a course of rediscovery. One that can now lead us to understand that the Sun's cyclical passage through the galactic electric sheet is the trigger for the great catastrophe cycle on Earth. Let's begin in the 1700s, with a surge of global exploration in science and the discovery of the evidence for these cycles. A dozen researchers became dozens in the 1800s as more evidence and excitement and terror over the implications of the evidence was mounting in an undeniable charge to science to explain all the evidence. The 1900s saw a further growth of the field. Many researchers gained considerable fame, while others were silenced. The end of the century saw the birth of the plasma universe connection to catastrophism, with the first global study of petroglyphs describing a solar catastrophe in antiquity. The story truly begins relevantly, however, with a man almost certainly responsible for the misdirection of the truth, Charles Hapgood. His Earth crust displacement theory became the torch for the catastrophe cycle, and when it bombed, it took down the entire field with it. We will demonstrate his motive and opportunity to cheat Einstein, that he knew the truth, he covered it up. 
in the 1940s, one of the most critical scenes of this theater played out at the North Pole. Major Maynard E. White led the first mission to map and understand the Arctic region, mostly because of navigational concerns and a monitor for Soviet attacks over the pole. When it became imperative to locate the magnetic pole position, the scientists found much more than they bargained for when they got their boots on the ground. They found evidence of marine strata, lifted to significant altitude, time after time, and with tropical corals found in that Arctic region strata, complementing the evidence of similar fossils found by Admiral Byrd in Antarctica, both complementing the prehistoric trees unearthed in Norway, which had no rings, indicating that they resided at the equator. All in all, Major White's team believed that they had unearthed nine levels of catastrophe on the planet. These findings were reported at the Pentagon, attended also by Paul Sippel of the Rand Corporation and presumably members of the Office of Strategic Services, where Charles Hapgood was a key player in geophysics. And working with Major White's findings and Dr. Sippel's experiments, it was concluded that Earth's magnetic pole began slowly accelerating followed by a whip around the geographic polar region, which somehow tilts the planet back and forth, which is why there is evidence of the polar regions in the same places over and over, because it always tilts right back and appears to have not moved over geologic time. They confirmed the catastrophe aspects of the new mountain range creation and ice age conditions immediately following the great event. Charles Hapgood Paul Sippel and the Pentagon are perhaps the most credible advocates of this 10 to 12,000 year cycle of disaster on Earth, especially when you consider what they did next. Hapgood continued his classified life while also teaching at various universities up through the late 60s. During the 50s, in the years following Major White's Arctic mission, Charles Hapgood stepped into the limelight in his public life with the famous Earth's crust displacement theory. It was a much mutated version from what we heard from Major White, where the poles do not go back and forth to the same places, the cycle is twice as long, and instead of a one-day event, it takes thousands of years to complete, and which was easily debunked by modern geophysicists, taking down the entire science of catastrophism with it. That is the famous version with the foreword written by Albert Einstein. That is not disputed, as his work with Hapgood was well known in the years before he died. However, Einstein was likely privy to the same information as Hapgood, and the final book came out after he died. There is no way of knowing if Einstein supported the radically different version that Hapgood eventually espoused. But what we do know is that Einstein saw the cycle of catastrophe and the turning over of the Earth. He was looking for a way to unlock the crust from the low velocity zone in the years before he died and we know he never did find a sufficient geophysical mechanism. Hapgood's version of the story, the public one, does not match what he and Sippel delivered to Major White at the Pentagon a decade earlier. It does not match the geological evidence or the timelines as well. Hapgood's versions, again, were easily debunked. Now, Einstein discussed this for years with Hapgood, and the only contribution was a foreword. Maybe. But, armed with that foreword, the weak version of crust displacement Hapgood placed over the field had the credibility to do so. The Chan Thomas version matches the version that somehow got lost between the Pentagon and Charles Hapgood's public life. It plainly contradicts the version that the CIA geophysicist Charles Hapgood was promoting around the world, even if he had promoted a different one in private. And Chan's version got classified as apparently did that real version of the story reported from what Major White and Paul Sippel provided. Einstein's key problem was the evidence of Greenland's tilting action, but a lack of weight in ice to pull the crust itself. Nobody had ever before discovered a mechanism for how the Earth would actually accomplish this unfathomable disrespect of inertia, basic physics, common logic. Frankly, the explanations blaming the hand of God had about as much evidence as anything else up until that point, that is, until the version Chan Thomas tried to put out. The postlude of Chan's work was not part of the sanitized release by the CIA, but it was included in a 1993 version of the book the CIA apparently didn't feel the need to classify due to the disrepute of the field of catastrophism. Nobody cares anymore. 
The postlude describes the only potential mechanism for connection of all the evidence from beneath our feet out to the sun. In recent years, the move in cosmology to see the galactic magnetic field structure as coherent, including the central Taurus and Jet model, has run through the national labs and NASA with incredible success. But one of the lesser publicized realizations of this fact is the scaled similarity with the solar system and with Earth's equatorial ion emission. You see, just like the solar system, the galaxy has an electromagnetic current sheet rippling around the equator separating the coherent fields of north and south. Now, in our solar system, the sheet ripples, wavering around the equator, bringing a spike in ion density and a reversal of the interplanetary magnetic fields. At Earth, although our orbit only crosses the exact solar equator twice per year, the solar electric current sheet hits Earth every two weeks and can produce a geomagnetic storm, inducing electric currents in the atmosphere and the ground. Earth is constantly protected by its own magnetic field, but in addition to things like solar flares, simply enduring a every two weeks solar system magnetic reversal and current sheet impact can cause those electromagnetic disruptions. So, what happens when the Sun and solar system encounter the galactic version its spike in density, and its magnetic reversal process. Let's actually add one more element to that puzzle, the dust. In our own solar system, and most we see, there is a dusty plane, like Saturn's rings. Density is low from planet formation over time, but in the galaxy that is not the case. There are dusty remnants of countless nova, and material left over from the star formation events of the galaxy. So the galactic sheet is more ion-dense, a galactic magnetic reversal, and a much more dusty region than we find in our own solar system. Now out of those three, it might seem like the galactic magnetic field reversal and the extra ion and electron density are the scarier propositions than the dust. But in fact, it might be the dust that makes the situation so awful. To understand why, we must investigate a phenomenon known as recurrent nova. Uh, there are quite a number of these recurrent nova that we do know of. Here's uh, an interesting picture of one called t -Pix. And by the way, this first image was the t Nova of 1997, and this was the t Nova of 2011. It just goes boom over and over and over again. Beautiful plasma physics swinging into view with how, they, how they're pretty sure the eruptive character is when it, when it comes to at least this one uh, recurrent nova. And so what this is here, and this list will be ever-expanding, uh, these are the current recurring, uh, recurring nova in the Milky Way, with the exception of the one that was just discovered about a week and a half ago uh, that was in the Large Magellanic Cloud. I don't know if they're going to count that one as being in the Milky Way or, or not. But take a look over, it's the one, two, three, four, fifth column where it has a bunch of years. Those are the known outburst years. Just take a look at how how many times these ones have actually gone boom, some of them. All of the lectures uh, that, that students are hearing right now and some of the best literature reviews on this topic that you can find very much conclude one thing on this list. It is egregiously under-inclusive. They say that our viewing of the heavens at this level is so nascent that there are almost certainly supernova that we have seen that aren't supernova that we will see them go boom again, and they will make this list. They believe that there are many with hundreds to thousands of year cycles that we simply have not seen go boom even once. And when we do, we'll have no idea it's a recurrent nova for hundreds to thousands of years more. And so, come to ask what the trigger mechanism is. And it is currently thought to be close-in binaries that is feeding material down onto one of the other stars and basically causes a thermonuclear explosion on the surface. There is no doubt that some recurrent nova are binaries feeding material down onto their partners, exploding in dramatic fashion. But this has implications for stars with dusty encounters on their way through the galaxy. Apart from dusty filaments and gaseous clouds, the central current sheet is going to have a higher dust density coinciding with the extra energetic particles. This is due to the same mechanism that allows a static duster to work in your home. That electric field is going to contain a surplus of that dusty material, and indeed, we're learning that the dust content overall 
may be much greater than we realized. The same mechanism described for recurrent nova binaries works on some level for these stellar dusty encounters, except with the current sheet, we also have a surplus of electromagnetic particles as well, all during a galactic magnetic field reversal. The proposal for what that could mean for a sun that is known to have the ability to produce rare superflare type outbursts already is something close to the stories of our ancestors insisting the sun has a dark side. Many astronomers, physicists, have uh, proposed, hypothesized, that at, at one time um, th there was an immense uh, solar outburst uh, from the sun, maybe 100,000 times what it is right now. Uh, Tommy Gold uh, was, was one of the first to suggest this, uh, this hypothesis, and um, it has been followed up by other people. So uh, many physicists, many astronomers believe that uh, in the past, millennia ago, there was an intense solar outburst, and uh, so I'm going to pursue that. One that I have been focused on lately has been the uh, antediluvian, the so-called uh, uh, biblical flood, if you will. On average, about every 10,000 years, you can expect a, uh, a catastrophe to happen. For the most part, the civilization is wiped out. That's uh, it's a horrendous catastrophe. It wipes out a pre-existing civilization and most of the people on Earth. And so, and so we must start anew. A consistency of reports from around the world of catastrophes that are amazingly similar. But a lot of people thought it's just what people dream up when they have a lot of time or they're dreaming or whatever. It's just stuff that people naturally come up with. Velikovsky uh, thought it was catastrophes that people witnessed and remembered. That's very different. Uh, what's called the four o'clock rapids, 56 uh, concentric, actually it's less than that because these have started to undergo rotation. Uh, here's one on the Navajo Reservation, Bronze Shield, Third Millennium, Middle East. Uh, this is a 56 ray from Kazakhstan. Somebody locked the doors because at this point people are going to start escaping, but this is a 56 ray circle axis mundi from uh, China. And these are actually drawn as uh, paintbrushes. You know, the axis uh, mundi uh, here, the tree coming up in the center. But anyway, the 56 are there in uh, uh, Arizona, it says the same thing, pick that one up. Uh, this is unfair, I picked the penumbra of a dense plasma focus, which also has 56, but it's a plasma, so we, we would expect it. It's not what they taught you in school, because they gave you it nice and coded. But uh, again, remember, the people in the U.S. government who saw the sun flare up and get the information back from the, the moon when, when we brought the stuff back, they were mostly scared. The sun does something terrible. They didn't know when. They felt they had no power to change it. You see, our tools have, have shown us things that they couldn't have possibly seen 50 and 70 years ago. It's one thing to look back at our ancestors and the stories they tell and say, you know what? You guys did a pretty good job inventing geometry, philosophy, architecture. But we're going to just take your most important stories and just going to pretend that you guys are crazy and made them up. That's, that's one giant leap, especially when they could predict eclipses. What you got on the left there is a piece of Muscovite mica. And this was taken here on Earth. It is only the third ever found rare cosmological event, they say. All of the black stuff around there those are normal fission tracks. That's real cosmic rays. That's what cosmic rays look like when they hit. But there's this exclusion zone around what they call the rare cosmological event. They know for a fact that it's not electrons or positrons. And they represent a residually input positive charge that didn't discharge outward, but it discharged from the center. And it looks exactly like the cosmic jet that blasts out of a star when it's born. It looks like the cosmic jets that you see from the center of a galaxy when it eats a star. And so how do you get a residual positive charge to basically bathe a crystal such that it takes it in and 
It can't discharge it out. It's still, it's still bathed in the stuff. It has to discharge in the center. There's actually missing atoms in the center. Now, they're not really missing. And I, I would argue that, while not definitive, um, something tremendous from the sun is not a terrible first hypothesis. The galactic trigger, the dust and gas mechanism for super flares and recurrent nova, the evidence on the moon, the stories of our ancestors, the global nature of the disaster, all point to the sun as the destroyer. But is it a super flare or a micronova, and does it really matter? To look at this question, we will first investigate the recent history of magnetic events on Earth, starting with the one ongoing now. The key element in this overall process is one that has already begun to unfold again here, and the clock is ticking as we move deeper into the shift. We know that Earth's magnetic field has begun an acceleration beyond its normal wander, and coincident with that is the loss of field strength. Magnetic reversals as rapid as 80 years have been recorded in the paleomagnetic record, and we are already more than double that many years into the current shift. While moving more slowly than the record fast reversals, things have begun to intensify. The Earth's magnetic field is currently decreasing by approximately 5% per decade, with the north and south magnetic poles set to meet in the eastern Indian Ocean. While the north is moving much faster, the south has already left the continent of Antarctica. The timeline is on the scale of a few decades to a hundred years, presuming things don't accelerate any further. Seem impossible? Well, these are the current motions, and that is not disputed. But this magnetic meeting point scenario also has interesting coincidences, and not a one of them is bright and sunny. First, this region was an incredibly interesting place a few years ago, until the data disappeared. Boy in event mode, south of Bali. For those who monitor the ocean, this is a familiar sight. The tail of this buoy starts with another, and begins long before there was such a thing as Station 53046. You will notice the primary areas of coverage, from the Solomon Islands, east to the Kermadec Islands, and up around to Sumatra, all locations of powerful earthquakes in the last few years, except this central three, including 53046 in the middle. Like I said, our story begins with a different buoy, 56003 to the right. She's had a turbulent life, as you can see here. In October of 2008, they put her down, and it was barely a month before the wild readings appeared. She was immediately taken offline. During the time she was down, another buoy was put in, 56001, to the left. Put down about 350 days later in October of 2009. She ran fine. 03 came back at a much lower sea depth, but in the exact same location before jumping back up in 2011. Station 56001 began deviating in November of 2011, and one must assume it was about that time they hatched a plan to add the third buoy to the group, 53046. It was a few months later in mid-2012 when she began to send back information, and within a few months the action began. Short but significant drops in the sea depth, this channel began reporting rapid seafloor rise and the buoy was taken out of commission by the Australian BOM. Clearly it is back, and in the exact same place, but when you factor in the further movement of the last 36 hours, more than 100 more meters, which is barely visible here at the end of the chart, we have officially eclipsed the 1200 meter mark, or just about 4,000 feet. This could be volcanic, could be related to the fault destabilization described in many of our previous videos. It looks like this part of the world is a significant place to watch. One of the biggest alternative news stories of that time was that a few days after this video aired, the buoy disappeared, and to this day, both it and its data are gone. Further complicating the story is that this region forms a geographically small triangle with the strongest magnetic point on Earth, the South Magnetic Pole, and with the Dragon's Triangle, Asia's version of the Bermuda Triangle, and indeed, that new pole position is near where those airplanes disappeared in recent years. Now, since one pole might reasonably be expected to emerge on the opposite side of Earth, we find that to be here in South America or perhaps just offshore. Forming a geographically small triangle with the weakest magnetic region on Earth, the South Atlantic Anomaly, and the Bermuda Triangle, where airplanes may have been known to encounter a difficulty or two over time. So the magnetic poles are on a collision course, at a point near the magnetic maximum point of Earth in the Dragon's Triangle, with the other side of the world, where the other pole would be, happening to sit next to the magnetic minimum point of Earth and the Bermuda Triangle. This is not your normal polar wander, this is a true shift, 
and Earth is already down approximately 20% in magnetic field strength and decreasing. As if all these coincidences aren't enough, there is one more, and it is the big one. I decided that uh, a magnetic reversal had an awful lot to do with the, the dinosaur extinction. And then the more I researched, the more I researched, I realized that magnetic reversals also, as far as I'm concerned, trigger ice ages, and that uh, that they return in a, in a cycle, in a regular pattern that, that we should actually be able to uh, to predict. When you have the onset of an ice age, of course, here's the here, here's the conundrum. The conundrum is that you've got to have a very large, rapid accumulation of glacial ice, which requires that the climate be cold enough that that ice does not melt through disappear through seasonal melting. At the same time, you have to increase the amount of evaporation from the oceans in order to loft this much moisture into the air that can precipitate out as snow that ultimately is compressed into glacial ice. The problem is, as you can see, is that it requires heat. So there's the kinds of conundrums that we're confronted with when looking at this. See, our predecessors from a few generations ago had it a lot easier because they could imagine that the whole process took 100,000 years or longer. We don't have that luxury anymore. A recent paper in the world's number one geophysics journal highlights this disaster that looms on the geological horizon, but it's not something that happens hundreds of thousands of years apart. We call them excursions, magnetic excursions, which is, you know, a term that's well integrated in the literature now, and it these are very short-lived reversals, but they're associated with uh, minima in field intensity, and it's the minima in field intensity that are uh, implicated because when you have low field strength, you enhance UVR. How do you go from the heat and energetic input of the solar blast to an ice age? The answer will ultimately determine whether a solar aspect is a super flare or a micronova. Sometimes admitting you don't know, at least your mind is open to look for more evidence. Right now, the pressing issue is, if I'm right that this next Gleisberg cycle is going to be when the reversal happens, I'm going to be like 99 years old. <laughs> and some of you are probably not going to make it either in 27 years but it's for the children and grandchildren and the unborn generations. Oddly, as vastly more energetic as a nova event would be than a solar flare, it may bring about more of the cooling effects to our planet. To explain the ice ages occurring with the magnetic reversals, we must actually look to either that nova-like event or the tilting of the Earth's crust, which vexed Einstein for a solution he never found beneath our feet. The sun does not bulge, in blatant disrespect of physics, it has a secret. Its cycles always build to greater crescendos, and the great solar blast could truly disrupt our entire planet. While Vogt does not advocate for a tilt of Earth, he does advocate for a reversal of rotation. The stories of the sun rising in the wrong place. The stories of the long night where tribes believed the sun might never rise again. The stories of the sun standing still in the sky. All of those ancient stories from around the world complement those found in the rock. Interestingly, either a 90 degree tilt and tilt back and forth, as was described by Chan Thomas, Albert Einstein, and Major White, or the rotation reversal advocated by Vogt, both leave evidence of the poles residing in the same positions over millions of years, cycle after cycle bouncing back to the same places, such that if you were to look over long periods of time, you might think the pole has never moved at all. Here, it is Einstein's hitting a brick wall that actually gives us our best chance to know what's happening. Like Chan Thomas and all who came before him, Einstein saw the tilting of the crust. His problem is that the most likely geophysical actor is Greenland. Its massive ice weight creates an uneven distribution of mass in the northern hemisphere, which due to centrifugal force of the planet's rotation, wants to spin at the equator. The problem of geophysics, which Einstein realized and never overcame, is that Greenland is unlikely to ever gain quite enough ice mass to unlock the rocky crust from the liquid mantle and float freely. It is that unlocking of the crust that is so critical to the crustal tilt possibility. Einstein, Major White, the researchers throughout history, 
and Chan Thomas are all focusing on what's known as the low velocity zone, a thin barrier between the rocky crust and fluid mantle, but which acts like plastic due to a delicate thermoelectric equilibrium, meaning the temperature and electrical activity create the plasticity and the friction. If that equilibrium were to be disrupted, it would allow the crust to float freely on the mantle and allow for any number of tilt or plate collision scenarios to occur. Well, how do you disrupt the thermoelectric equilibrium that's creating the low velocity zone? A major solar blast. Such an eruption would immediately change viscosity in the magma due to cosmic ray bombardment and also cause temperature changes, which would only add to the temperature changes resulting from any induced currents that resulted when the shockwave hit Earth's magnetic field. Those events are indeed globally induced, and they are electric. We may also scale up the two known drivers of length of day glitches. Believe it or not, those are real. They are usually small glitches, self-correcting or spread over long periods of time, and are either caused by major solar storms, geomagnetic jerks from Earth's core, or in the case of the longer term variations, Earth's long term magnetic field changes. Now since the length of day means we are talking about rotation speed and crustal motion atop the mantle, it bears mentioning that in the greatest solar storm imaginable, which could induce current all the way to Earth's core if we know modern day blasts can affect the mantle, makes for possibly combining the two causes of rotation speed glitches in the same energetic solar mechanism that would satisfy the ancient stories disrupt the low velocity zone, and unlock the crust. We are now at the second time we have found ourselves confronting way too many coincidences to ignore. It's a little bit difficult to, uh, to go back and to say, well, the story is not exactly so. We have the phenomena from all places, from the bottom of the sea with ash and with nickel, which is of meteoric origin. The terrestrial axis moved. And that pale paleomagnetism proves us that terrestrial axis, that magnetic axis, and possibly like Ankan and other of Manchester, claim that it, the Earth turned over. We know now from observation of Professor Danjon, director of Paris Observatory, that that um, flares on the sun may influence the speed of rotation of the Earth and there were sudden changes. We generally don't like to know that we are traveling on a accident-prone planet. What were all these ancient people saying? What were all these people trying to remember? We must take the words left to us in generations of oral histories and written records of observations in the sky as instances of events that were not the norm. They were so important and unusual but they have come through time as warnings left by our brothers and sisters the ancient past. These events were not lunar eclipses or earthquakes. Now in this time, with our understanding of celestial mechanics, atmospheric, and geological sciences, we must try to make sense of these recorded events and untangle them from worship and prophecy. It's time to look at them for what they actually provide as a roadmap of things to come. We can ask the question, has the Earth stopped rotating for any length of time in recorded history? and the voices call out to us from the ancient Middle East. The book of Joshua, in 1405 BC. O sun, stand still over Gibeon. O moon, over the valley of Aijion. 1013. The sun stood still, and the moon stood motionless while the nation took vengeance on its enemies. The event is recorded in the scroll of the Upright One. The sun stood motionless in the middle of the sky. It did not set for a full day. And those same voices call out to us from ancient Peru. Also in 1405 BC, the 40th Inca Capac was Pachatuti, the reformer that started the worship of the sun god Inti. In 1405, there occurred a frightening darkness. Quote, good customs were forgotten, and people were given to all manner of vice. There was no dawn for 20 hours. After a great outcry, confessions of sins and sacrifices and prayers, the sun finally rose. Has the world experienced a global cataclysm before? And will it happen again? And what was remembered and how is it described to begin again? The voices call out from the ancient American Indians, and this is the ninth and last sign. You will hear a dwelling place in the heavens above the earth that shall fall in a great crash. It will appear as a blue star, 
Very soon after this, the ceremonies of my people will cease. As this cataclysm happened before, the voices call out from ancient China. There were seen fire-breathing dragons leaping into the sky. They call out from ancient Siberia. The earth was on fire from both horizons. And they call again from the ancient past in the voices of the Inca. At the Intihuatana was a stone cut with great precision to observe and measure the movements of the sun. The name meant that which binds the sun, and it makes it return, at least it disappear, returning the earth into a darkness that had occurred once before, according to the legends. Did the Inca, Chinese, Siberians, and the rest remember the last Micronova event in their oral histories? We need to take these people seriously. Now let's take a moment for the respect of geophysics and things like basic inertia of the Earth's rotation being unimaginably unstoppable. That indeed is the current prison from which Earth's catastrophe cycle must escape. The tilting of Earth's crust is restrained by the evidence that the poles and the ice existing at the polar regions have done so for millions of years, and both the tilting crust and Vought's rotation reversal are battling the force of inertia of our rotation. The reason that the poles and ice matter is because the entire topic of catastrophe was umbrellaed under Charles Hapgood's absurd version, where seven degree tilts happen randomly and over a thousand years and never tilted back to put the poles in their original positions. This concept was easily debunked and there went the field of study. However, the previous versions to Hapgood's Votes, Rotation, Change, Major White's Insider Version, and the Chan Thomas Classified Version all put the poles in the same places over millions of years. Furthermore, the most highly cited work on past pole positions, which was used to debunk Hapgood's work, and which was used to crush the field of catastrophes as a whole, actually has a correction paper published, which was cited far, far less often, and which nobody really remembers. But, it changed the past pole positions from the original publication, in some cases to the point where the original paper had them on the opposite side of the planet, as wrong as you can be with a polar search. Another of the well-cited papers debunking the polar motion came from a bachelor's student at Columbia. While in theory, a major paper does not require a major degree. This student worked under the CIA-controlled programs at Columbia, at the time when it was becoming so rampant and overbearing that the local community had begun an uproar. This is how you control a scientific theory. Whether we further investigate the problem of the poles in the past or we cling to the concepts that don't require them, the only reason this topic is considered pseudoscience is because a wildly mutated version of the story was put out by a CIA agent masquerading as a professor and which somehow overthrew the centuries of study and literally the world of evidence. Uh, one of the things that you and I have been talking about are the idea of these micronova events on the sun, these periodic cyc cyclical eruptions on many stars uh, based on the Kepler-2 satellite uh, data. And that as this stuff is sprayed out into the universe around our inner solar system, and if these things could have been you know, blasted out from the sun in these periodic explosions, and that could have been deposited on the moon, on Earth, on Mars. Uh, the fact that they're only about 12 miles down indicates they're not deep penetrator meteor impacts. So it leads me now to believe that these magnetic anomalies, if not all of them, certainly some of them, uh, could be from solar eruptions. And this is just solar material that has splattered out and these planets have run into in this huge cloud of debris once the, once the sun releases these nova events. Last ice age, we had catastrophic rains, catastrophic flooding. I believe this goes along with the solar outburst at the time, which caused uh, glacial melting virtually instantaneously in the uh, ice core records and in the sediment records, but particularly the ice core record. We see that we snapped out the end of the last ice age virtually overnight. I mean, literally, the microstratigraphy is that accurate and what happens to you know what could be the cause of 
coming out of the ice age so quickly. We're talking an incredible temperature increase. And based on many lines of evidence I've now been accumulating, I'm convinced this was a major solar outburst, a major solar event. I'm now convinced that we have direct evidence on the Giza Plateau of a, quote, lightning strike, unquote, which would not be a lightning strike in the sense of normal thunderstorms, that type of thing. But I'm convinced that it probably is indicative of what was happening at the end of the last ice age and that the Giza Plateau itself was literally hit during the solar outburst. But I now am convinced that we have on the plateau direct evidence of this as we have elsewhere on Earth. And it turns out on the plateau was found something known as the inventory stella. And this is something I've been studying in great detail with my uh, colleague, Dr. Manu Saifzadeh. And it talks about Khufu, the supposed builder of the Great Pyramid, acknowledging that the Sphinx was already there and that the Sphinx had been struck by, quote, lightning in much more ancient times. The lightning strike that he speaks of is between the second pyramid and the sphinx. So the, the pyramid with the capstone, if you will, there that's still intact. And uh, uh, between that and the sphinx, the back end of the sphinx. So it's, it's um, vitrification everywhere and a big scar going deep into the ground. We have major vitrification because of this, quote, lightning strike. And again, I would stress it's it's well beyond anything that you would get with normal atmospheric you know, thunderstorms. Uh, but vitrification there, I'm convinced, um, as we're finding elsewhere, that ties in with the, um, the phenomena, uh, and I'll use the term cataclysm at the end of the last ice age. When you have vitrification at this level on something like the Giza Plateau, it cannot be a meteorite or a comet or an asteroid because that would have literally destroyed the monuments. On the monuments. You wouldn't, mon- wouldn't have the monuments left. On the inventory stella, it talks about this huge lightning bolt knocking off part of the back, basically, of the Sphinx. There is a concern for the lower level L shell magnetic fields the smaller arches instead of the global fields connecting to the polar regions. In most solar blasts, even the worst ones we only see every decade or so now, the magnetosphere of Earth compresses down to those outer L shells, but still connects to the polar region in the most exposed outer zones. But in the extreme scenario, it could be very different. The modeling of the great solar storm of 1859, for example, which lit telegraph wires on fire and shocked operators, came close to hitting the lowest level L shells. And if that were to actually happen on Earth in a super flare or micronova, then you get the potential for a magnetar type discharge. Where its own processes are thought to surge energy through its L shell fields, arc down and literally crack the surface of the star. At that point, the loss of power grids might be one of the lesser concerns. As for the electric geology, lab results confirm this action on terrestrial planets. The only question is, did it happen before and could it happen again? You know, you have to bring in new evidence and it has to adjust your theory because theories are just theories. Now, one of the interesting things about the Clementine mission is it took uh, magnetic readings of the entire surface of the moon and found the largest magnetic anomalies on the far side of the moon, around von Karman and uh, Lehman's uh, craters on the far side, which is exactly where the Chinese just landed a lander. Does China know? Does the U.S. government know? All the information shared here is published in major journals, with admittedly a bit of connect the dots as well, trying to fill in the gaps of the researchers throughout history with the tools they didn't have. Certainly, it seems like the CIA had it pegged decades ago, at least the fact that there was a cyclical catastrophe, and perhaps as early as Major White's Project Nanook expedition to the North Pole. It all relates to the all-important question of survival in the catastrophe, and the only good news we have to deliver in this presentation. There is evidence of tremendous retreat of the populace into caves and tunnels thousands of years ago. Multiple times, actually. These tunnels have been reused countless times over history, including during wartime and by smugglers, but their purpose was once to house the humans who, for some reason, could not remain at the surface. 
as terrible as this event is, we must remember that we are here today, so we have survived countless catastrophes and come out on top of this world. We are survivors. Our government appears to believe it has what it takes for the country to survive. What may have begun as underground shelter for the military elites, and which may have expanded as the result of threat of nuclear war in the mid-20th century, what exists now is a complex, interconnected, underground world far greater in capacity than could ever be needed by the military. One must genuinely begin to ask how many people could fit down there. There are many maps on the internet and lists of deep bunkers and bases, but these are just the ones we know about. Most on these maps are even acknowledged publicly. There's no telling just how much more exists and how ready the country really is. The U.S. government knows some of this stuff. They know the sun does Nova. There's no debate about that. The question is, is they don't want you guys to know about it. If it's no longer a secret, there's no point in keeping it a secret. They're desperately looking for any other explanation. Don't look at the sun. That's it. The rebirth of catastrophism has unquestionably begun. For those watching our daily program, it may already be obvious how much more rapidly the papers on the topics relevant to Earth's catastrophe cycle are coming out and how much more attention they're receiving in the larger media. We are six months past the release of our book on this topic, The Next End of the World, The Rebirth of Catastrophism, and the last six months have been an even more incredible flurry. The topics we cover in the book are now being flushed out and expanded and reanalyzed at a rate that is staggering, utterly staggering. Here, six months after our book proclaiming the field had been reborn, let me show you just what's happened since then. From the ancient stories to the astrophysics to the paleogeologic studies and the lab work showing how worlds are worked by these electric events. Here we go. Would have been really nice if these guys had just hurried about a month or two so I could get this in there alongside Billy's lab experiments. One of the most voluminous aspects of the field's rebirth is in new corings and sediments and similar analyses showing these events within both the 12,000-year cycle and the 6,000-year magnetic half-cycle. We are seeing their confirmation at various places across the globe and their varying intensity across the globe, suggesting it's never a global, unsurvivable disaster, but a harsh transition nonetheless. We are learning more about how our species was challenged but endured each of these past events, and we've seen modern technology extend these studies into deeper analyses of our ongoing situation and the secular variation of the field in general. Few people know of the new observation sites planned to monitor the field event, including one by the Indonesian government that is exactly where the magnetic pole shift has them set to meet, yet another nod to what modern observations and the last generation of catastrophists claimed as well. The most critical studies in this line of the field came with the identification of another anomalous event in the field progress back in 2015, which explains most of our scary geomagnetism videos from that year, and a confirmation of the 2017 acceleration of the field centered on the Pacific sector, above that LLSVP. Remember that last bit about the field changes tied to the regions above the large internal Earth structures for later in this video. A quick stop at Greenland, where two bombshells dropped in about a week, the first suggesting that Greenland melted off entirely in the recent geologic past, and then the second describing warm periods at half the age of the alleged oldest Greenland ice. The datings of corings must be re-envisioned entirely. Folks, that's the retrospective look at the magnetic cycle and Earth changes during past events. Now, let's head out to space. In the realm of Nova, we continue to see the standard view challenge with anomalies and extended outburst ranges, and the Nova we've been missing are starting to show up with the latest technology and in ways they never thought to look before. Dr. Sofu's first paper made the book. The follow-up discoveries were just a few weeks too late. We continue to see the micro and even nano Nova limit pushed with one at X-ray luminosity around only a strong M-class solar flare from the sun. Nobody is claiming a 10 to the 34 erg burst from our star is impossible anymore. We continue to see shockers like planets surviving supernova, let alone the smaller nova events, and we continue to be reminded of the broad array of names given to the recurring stellar outbursts. Just a reminder, 
This is just in the last six months since the book came out because you'd be forgiven for forgetting. We're at the whales next where we've got confirmation of their dependence on Earth's magnetic field, and that happened about the time we were learning of their distress being at record levels amidst the ongoing magnetic excursion here at Earth. We saw more on the conductivity of the deep Earth and how it should be part of the entire conductive system of the globe, part of the electromagnetic mechanism for glitching the Earth's rotation changing the length of a day, with solar storms getting a nice nod confirming their role in the matter, especially in its interaction with the geomagnetic field, and as that field changes, so changes our speed, apparently. The fastest 28 days on record were in 2020 and were speeding up even more in 2021. Would have been really nice to have that in the book, along with the asthenosphere drag of the crust which they thought was impossible until apparently just after the book came out. We see the difficult science of galactic mapping continue with identification of the magnetic structures of the galaxy, with a look to the side, so to speak, revealing the curve of the wave, showing we're in the southern positive sector, heading into the northern negative sector. We've seen them trace these ripples to the circumnuclear region, even way inside the galaxy, and as they confirm that the Parker spiral in the solar system extends way, way out to the outer reach, as the lab work and plasma physics demand, we know the same must be true for the outer reach of the galaxy as well. And we have seen a number of excellent studies on the sun's current sheet effect on Earth that can be used to understand how the sun will react so violently to the passage of the galactic sheet. Remember this one from a few months ago? A strange radio signal is expected from a star recently having undergone its ignition of disaster by the galactic sheet, as was the case with the Proxima Centauri super flare a few years ago. We expected to continue to hear about changes on the planets, and the Pluto atmospheric collapse was the last one to make the book. Neptune's storm reversal news broke a few weeks later, and is impossible without a major reversal of some major system on the planet. In terms of the ongoing event here, our ability to spot changes in new observations in Earth's upper atmospheric behavior, extreme detail about the processes of Earth's electrodynamics, is helping to better understand the data, and where they believe they previously underestimated flux values, I argue those flux values should be changing due to Earth's ongoing magnetic event. Sort of like the polar mesospheric summer echoes that are increasing. These are driven by charged dust and ice, and while they blamed a colder mesosphere on making more ice, the problem is at 90 below zero it's all frozen already, and the increase in charged particles due to Earth's weakening magnetic field is an excellent explanation, and add some extra dust coming with the galactic sheet and we've got a one-two punch explaining this perfectly. Some of the observations are less hidden from view. Numerous similar reports around the globe are all bested by the one from the Arctic, shattering records, and is on the increase, another we'd expect given that the northern polar cusp is where the solar energy prefers to enter the Earth. As we learn more about what drives the chemistry of the solar corona, we ask what signal of the galactic magnetic reversal would be present in the sun now, and within 20 days we learn that indeed the solar chemistry is changing, and at the exact time the polar mesospheric echoes increased at Earth. The primary solar chemical changes are beginning as well. Now remember that part about the geomagnetic field variation tied to the LLSVP internal structures of Earth, the solar storm Earth rotation glitch story. Here, we discover yet another confirmation that electromagnetic variations and core mantle coupling are the cause of expected changes in the length of a day, confirming the anomalous glitches tied to geomagnetic jerks and solar storms, both in the statistical analysis and explaining the mechanism. They tie the slow variation, or delay in the Pacific, to what we inferred from the first real acceleration event for the Pacific happening in 2017, again, above the LLSVP skeleton, and indeed, these are the preceding routes of the geomagnetic reversal process. Not news to you observers, just nice to see it in the journals. As more and more studies begin to point out the climatological changes associated with previous cycles were to blame for extinctions rather than human hunting, the seriousness of the situation is appreciated more by the field and the larger population. From the multitude of papers like this one on such risk in journals most people never hear about, to the story of 2021 so far, by far, which was spread around the world, acting as a beacon, warning anyone and everyone who knows we're in the middle of the next event now, and what that means for our future is the pattern change rate suggests 20 to 30 years until the climax. Folks, that was six 
months. Nearly every major avenue in the book confirmed or taken further down the line. The planets, nearby stars, Earth itself, and the Sun, all commanding our attention. I'd say the field has been adequately reborn, wouldn't you? The rebirth of catastrophism has been catalyzed by the Age of Information, getting its hands on the history of evidence and analysis of Earth's catastrophe cycle, and the evidence suggesting the next one is unfolding now. By the end of this video, you will understand that this is much more than the rebirth of catastrophism. It is a complete science revolution, hiding in plain sight. First, the Earth has hit the accelerator, and we've seen auroral anomalies and unexpected severity of space weather impacts. We've seen absurd land motions attempted to be blamed on farmers digging, okay. We've seen the seas catch fire, not once actually, but twice. Allegedly the first was a broken pipe that coincidentally got hit by lightning, but the second one gave itself away more plainly in the mud ejection. We have seen such a surge in the earth discharge version of lightning, upward, that they are starting to understand it very well. Talented people like Dan Robinson are able to get shots weekly that photographers used to dream of once in a lifetime. There have been no less than 50 papers in the last four months identifying one or more of the last magnetic excursion events, some from cave sediments, others from corings, but we continue to see the cycle, even though some still confuse Lake Mungo and Mono Lake, and even today, many confuse Le Champ with the half-cycle Adams event around 42,000 years ago. It shows up a lot, and so do the half-events Helena Pali and the Noah event, 18,000 and 6,000 years ago. There have been dozens of new recurrent nova, leaving a star behind or performing encores of previously seen events, and seen many more nova-level events with energies no bigger than the sun's solar flares. And in terms of driving forward the known science, the importance of the sun's current sheet, the solar wind BY, the interplanetary magnetic and electric field, is as big a factor in Earth's electrodynamic near-space interactions as CMEs and coronal holes. Of course, these are major impact studies in big journals to the tune and detail I used to expect over years' time, and they are important because they tell us about what the galactic current sheet is doing to our solar system and nearby stars now, and what it's going to do to the Sun. And speaking of the galactic current sheet itself, the high-level modeling is getting unbelievable, especially in terms of how many waves they are producing in just a small section of the galactic interior, more than the total number of visible dusty spiral arms in the galaxy as a whole. They have also begun to discover more of the expected small-scale features like the filaments running the interstellar magnetic field, the galactic magnetic field through the midplane. M82 was discovered to have almost identical character to the Milky Way in the models, and while plasma and electric cosmologists like to think of magnetic fields other than necessarily being open or closed, it's literally the qualitative description of the interplanetary magnetic field connections through the solar wind. Just, this is at the stellar and galactic scale. Now that would be the peak in galactic astrophysics for the last four months, if the key competing theory to this one wasn't obliterated again by Bennett and Bovey. While the waves would still inflict the same effects on the Sun and solar system if it was due to a dwarf galaxy collision ripple, we do like to get the entire story right, which is why we wanted to add to the knowledge of the amplitude of the galactic current sheet waves of 60 to 170 parsecs, the wavelength of those rippling undulations, tens of light years across. Compare that to the visible arms of the spiral galaxy, a thousand light years across or more. Of course, the real zenith of the galactic astrophysics news the last quarter was the identification of those waves themselves, here in our neighborhood. It's actually where the wavelength data came from, and the hum and associated anomalous signals all help solidify the notion we are inside the galactic current sheet right now. Our look at nearby stars continued, Proxima's continued activation in the wake of its super outburst a decade ago continues, and we can say the same for Barnard's star, since its exoplanet was debunked, meaning its luminosity changes are due to its luminosity. We also have the first look at Wolf 359 in about two years. This one is out ahead of Barnard, and we confirm it's super flaring. Its initial activation would have been before the modern scopes that could see it. Mars is really the only planetary level change we saw updated the last four months, but the confirmation and continuation of its anomalous seismicity, which is predicted to ring even higher soon based on the patterns, is an indication of the great shift on the red planet as well. 
We saw more detailed identification of the non-human extinction parameters for megafauna during the last event, about 12,000 years ago, and while we've seen about a dozen articles on the minutia of the bird magneto reception, the shark study was clearly the observer's favorite in the magnetobiology realm. Now we're going to get to the big stories. Folks, this one debunked the last great doubt about the imminence of danger in Earth's magnetic situation. Some have drawn comfort in Earth's relatively high modern field strength compared to paleomagnetic records, but as we've responded for years, no. How strong you get inside of the cycle doesn't relieve you of the cycle. When it's your time, it's time. Up next, it's the large low shear velocity provinces, the LLSVPs, the massive internal skeleton of Earth, and they're getting better at mapping its fingers up to hot spots. With a confirmation of the direct connection between the core and Hawaii, those near the Spanish islands in the Atlantic, and reunion in the Indian Ocean. We also learned that the core of Earth is lopsided. All that stuff about symmetrical Earth immune to perturbation instabilities is out the window from the surface terrain down to the core. The total global electric circuit connections with the solar wind provide further evidence of how our star will be affected under the galactic magnetic reversal coming with the current sheet. What is most interesting is the rapid forcing identification, also important to solar climate forcing, even faster than the minute scale forcing on clouds that we've seen before, near instantaneous, instant, light speed fast in terms of the forcing influence of geomagnetic dings from the sun. Speaking of that, the unusual chorus waves at the top of the sky are a sign of changing upper earth under the weakening magnetic field. The total electrical influence on lightning has gone beyond the Arctic to allow for the identification of two new kinds of lightning this summer alone. The weakening field is driving critical frequency changes in the F2 layer and is allowing for sustained ionospheric disruptions despite weakening solar activity. Despite that lower solar flare impact the last couple decades, the Earth has been taking an equal pounding due to the weakening protection. And we have also seen the carbon story, the Arctic story, and the real cause of climate change collide as even the lower atmospheric chemistry and reaction is changing now. We had a fantastic update on Earth's rotation glitches, being tied to geomagnetic jerks from the core, and we saw that they were actually mistaken. Both the cycles they identified are basically solar cycles known in other fields to be connected already. We got more on the conspiracy side after learning that Major White did more than just Project Nanook in the Arctic. He directed and appointed spies in Europe and Africa immediately afterwards, a weird task for a pilot explorer, and then was in charge of manned spaceflight operations for Apollo, which found the glass and other evidence of the great solar flash. By the way, the best evidence for the Earth turning over 90 degrees comes from the evidence Major White stole from the Pentagon meetings to give to his son to publish years later, and in that same vein. These scientists are right now being tricked and trying to figure out how dinosaurs may actually not have been cold-blooded. Otherwise, they couldn't live where they found these eggs in the Arctic, of course. The other explanation is that this region wasn't at the pole during that cycle, and the only reason those eggs were found and preserved in the first place is because a warm area was rapidly inundated and frozen in time. As if the no ejection nova events we've previously seen weren't amazing enough, we've seen two no luminosity ejection nova events, one at the giant star that blinked and a confirmation of that hypothesis for Betelgeuse as well. Sometimes the main, primary, and seemingly only nova component is the thick dust, and you don't get a major flash. Some think the other giant star has an orbiting disk that's occulting it, but they've never seen it before or since, and they know Betelgeuse's dust came from a dust ejection event on the star itself. After wondering for years if indeed this government university and private interest funded visual was a centrifugal breakout nova from the equatorial region of the sun, rather than a CME as the video label suggests, we learn they have found exactly that out in space, and it matches the predicted solar micronova energy range we have forecasted, if not a touch smaller. Hopefully, we recall the sun's magnetic fields are changing and that the helium abundance is changing. We got the confirmation and update of that discovery just a few weeks ago. The sun's helium abundance has begun to change, and it won't be many years before this takes over visually. Then, of course, the paper of the year so far, the identification and naming of one of the key cycles at the foundation of Earth's disaster cycle, 
the connection between major solar events and the half-cycle climate smacks on the planet, the Heinrich events. The solar events finally joined at the hip in the publications, as they have been in the sediment and throughout time. Folks, there are now almost no remaining holes in the total theory, and that's including the minutia, which wouldn't even really affect the outcome one bit. But the best question at this moment should be this, or maybe more appropriately phrased, what the heck is going on? Why do I have more to report by the month, by the week? Why are the key arms of the disaster so well studied now after being fringe and cringe for a distinguished professor just a decade ago? Those papers are the top professors, top folks from NASA and major organizations, the journals with gatekeepers and the peer reviewers. There are two answers to why this is happening, and the first one is there is an absurd number of scientists who are starting to get it. On a weekly basis, I coordinate with dozens of those scientists at various universities and organizations, and they know what's coming. They know what they can publish, and they know how to use their free time wisely. This is spilling over into abundance recognition, citation power, and more. And that is where the second part comes in. You. Folks are silent friends in high places at NASA and ESA and national labs and prestigious campuses. They have a message for you. You are driving this change. You click the links. You watch the videos. You discuss the topics and share information. Do you understand how views, downloads, and citations of papers leads to a direct change in the researchers, the journals, and the direction of the fields? When a journal that averages a few dozen or maybe a hundred views on its top articles a year does one special episode on magnetic excursions, gets thousands of views and downloads per paper, that it doesn't affect them? It's been affecting them this entire time. You have been. Let's keep going, because the snowball is rolling now, and it's all downhill from here. The expansion of the NOVA category in progenitors and triggers continues, including the NOVA-like variables and those that seem to jump around between the categories. This is, of course, imperative to the bigger picture of the more widespread understanding of the variety and range of NOVA events, triggers, and progenitors. We continue to see more identification of the processes of ozone destruction. This is expected as an ongoing effect of our weakening magnetic field, and is now seen in the only positive ozone trend being at the South Pole, where those chemicals had previously accumulated. And that analysis didn't include the record low ozone levels in 2020 were dropping worldwide. We also saw how the drops in ozone can hide in some data sets and not in others, which is where pretty much all of those opposing statement papers are coming from. We follow up the previously reported weird animal behavior with the orca attacks. No, it's not unheard of, but they are acting out in incredible numbers and in as unfamiliar waters as those sharks and whales and racing pigeons. We also continued to see the ongoing geomagnetic biology topic advance from that navigation and other aspects of magnetoreception to even the negative effects of inclement space weather and geomagnetic minimum during secular variation, like the magnetic excursion we're heading towards now. The continued identification of polar summer mesospheric echo signatures brings back the big story that thermosphere temperatures are wholly driven by the sun and geomagnetism. Way up there in the sky, it's not CO2 as was previously believed. There's no signature of it at all. And so their explanation of CO2 for those mesosphere changes takes another hit. The explanation that it's the Earth's weakening magnetic field is strengthened. When you continue to get confirmations of the natural forcing down to the stratosphere, the explanation that it's Earth's weakening magnetic field working those layers above, again, is strengthened. Then things get very interesting as the Heinrich events, already tied to the 6,000 year solar cycle, now are also tied to the tropical hydroclimate events as well as those cold outbreaks at mid and high latitude. Speaking of which, a super green, greenest of the green Sahara, is what existed at the last half cycle, 6,000 years ago. The NOAA event, which needed more evidence, got more in the volcanic realm, almost right on the nose. And in the isotope record, where this might be the best example of it, as the impact on deposition dwarfs what we saw even at the full 12,000 year cycle event, the Younger Dryas and Gothenburg magnetic excursion. Speaking of which, the volcanic evidence from the last event got strengthened as well. We add Texas sediment evidence to that in Europe of the German Eiffel volcanic complex during the Younger Dryas. And when it comes to the LLSVPs, the Earth's internal skeleton, we got a non-flashy but critically important aspect of their character confirmed as recycling crustal material 
material is found near the edges of the LLSVPs, but they themselves are not subducted crust. They are, in fact, core mantle boundary protrusions. These and the low velocity zones are critically important aspects of the disaster disruption in terms of the geophysical insult. And when it comes to mantle heaving, earth tilting, and the waters below, the evidence for unthinkable reservoirs beneath our feet rang out once again. We're standing on more water than you can envision, a lot more. Of the few Earth's rotation glitch stories, this was my favorite of the last 75 days. And for those who don't know, it is already mainstream science that many of Earth's length of day glitches, our rotation hiccups, are tied to solar storms, geomagnetic jerks, and longer solar cycles. This just happens to be a half harmonic of the sun's 3,000 year flare cycle. Speaking of geomagnetic jerks, the latest one was a global event. This compared to the 2017 event concentrated in the Pacific sector. It's not just the upper atmosphere having anomalies we can easily tie to the changing magnetic field, but the field itself continues to show new tricks. And speaking of new tricks, how about this one? Yes, it's just the baby step for the white dwarfs. Why they don't extend it further when they know solar flares produce elements, every known element was detected in the solar wind by the JPL Genesis mission in the 90s, and the ongoing studies in this field are exceptionally detailed. Recall from previous updates that we know the sun's helium content is changing, and recall the number of coronal rain stories we had this week, how the falling condensate triggers eruptions, how it is triggered by a disruption at the upper corona, where the magnetic fields of the sun responsible for the helium change are also known to be changing. And this process represents the second way to get the solar micronova shell built up. We've now got two options under the disruption from the galactic magnetic reversal, and that shell, while heated in the micronova to nuclear relevant temperatures, is in fact released via deflagration, as we continue to see discovered in space, deflagration of the accumulated shell. Of course, we've seen the other planets continue their destabilizations. Mars seismicity increased in magnitude again, and the biggest one lasted 90 minutes. Jupiter's great red spot is tightening, and the wind is speeding up like a ballerina pulling arms in to spin more quickly. And we got confirmation about Pluto. It did lose a fifth, 20% of its atmosphere, in no more than two years, 2016 to 2018. The galactic sheet forcing the solar system shift continued to be flushed out mathematically in the models, but still showing too broad a region between galactic magnetic reversals. We did get some big confirmations of unmixed gases and waves of high-density clouds tens of parsecs apart. That should sound familiar. It's how I describe the gunk stuck to the electrostatic current sheet. We got a critical scalability confirmation about flux interactions from the heliopause out into galactic space, and it works exactly how the Earth-Sun magnetic connection works at the polar cusps as well. We'd hear the same in the abstract for a talk coming next month, confirming the current sheet and Parker instability-like nature of the rippling galactic field is indeed not just observable, but workable into the models. All you need is nova-level energy along the way. You heard correctly. Now, they used supernova in the paper as an example, but mathematically, if the current sheet triggers super flares and micronova and dwarf nova along the way, you get the same, if not more, energy. And so let me go ahead and simplify what I just said for you. We have shown a lot of the evidence already. They know from the polarization, dust density, gamma signatures, and more that the galactic current sheet ripples every few tens of light years, bringing the galactic magnetic reversal but they have never been able to quite make the observations fit into their models or the theory. Now, what it finally took to bring those models and theory up to the observations of the current sheet was nova level energy along the way. You've got to be kidding me. After all this, the galactic magnetic triggering of the solar micronova and similar events throughout the galaxy is what it takes to complete the picture. Not on board yet? Let's add to everything we know about the Earth's rotation in the Sun, and add in the fact that it's the thermosphere super rotation, its faster rotation than the ground below, being due to energy from above and geomagnetism. This of course must be true, if all those other connections we've implied down to the core are true as well. Last but not least, folks, I think they finally spotted the dust. Their asteroid explanation is not a good one, and basically they've just realized there is more dust in the solar system than there should be. And if that's not the prediction of the last three years come true, I'm really not sure what is. One of the most foundational elements of this channel, one of the most remarkable moments in history time and time again, and one of the most dire conditions of our modern existence is the weakening of Earth's magnetic field. 
We're going to dive deeper on a recent update to this ongoing event, and we will end by learning just how fast the magnetic field is going to be declining when it hits full speed. This week, we reviewed this article and discussed how the weakening magnetic field is beginning to allow significant penetration advancement of charged particles into Earth's upper atmospheric layers. To understand just how significant of a change has taken place, we will look not at the polar fields wrapping around the globe, but the L shells, the smaller arcs that touch lower latitudes, and while they go up to L6 and beyond in theory, the innermost shells here are what are most important. The number corresponds to Earth radii altitude, so the L1.5 shell extends out to 1.5 Earth radii. The particles in focus in this paper are said to have dropped from a little less than one Earth radius down more than 500 kilometers, and that is not such a small change at all, especially when you consider that it's not been a constant drop, not by a long shot. The process has been accelerating, making this a direct measurement of one of the scariest potential events for an excitement of that lowest L shell in a solar superstorm. Both of those animations are from NASA and represent what happens when the sun juices up those fields in modern day regular storms and when a major event happens modeled with a magnetar burst. That'd be fun on Earth, eh? Now this outlook of sustained acceleration to significant levels makes us ask, well just how fast can this magnetic event unfold on Earth? Well for that, it helps to look at curves. This is literally the best resolution graphic that paper had to offer which is absurd. But top right, we have the drop in altitude over time, but with a straight regression line that obviously does not capture the true nature of the curve, which is accelerating downward. And so, I just copied that real curve onto a blank sheet, and we can start from here. Folks, I've looked at the data of the magnetic field weakening enough to know that this curve of particle penetration looks pretty darn close to the overall field loss. So, how fast are things going to get? Well, first, let's review where we are now. The most famous announcement of the 10% field loss was in the year 2000 by NASA. Here, we not only learned about the weakening field, but that the magnetic poles were shifting and speeding up. In the north, this modern shift began in 1859, coincident with the great Carrington event solar storm, and the North Pole has now gone over the top, as they say, and is heading southward towards Siberia. During this time, the south magnetic pole has been on a slower saunter but is way out in the lead, already having left the continent of Antarctica. In 2010, the European Space Agency updated that number from 10% to 15%, which is really a psychotically huge jump from the 10% lost from 1859 up to 2000. But it was real, and the leader of the mission measuring Earth's magnetic field made no bones about the fact that Earth's magnetic field was getting ready to flip. He quickly and very quietly lost his position shortly after revealing that Earth's magnetic field had gone from losing 5% per century to 5% per decade. This put a lot of folks on notice, especially those who were repeatedly proving that these events are extinction-level moments for many species and major hits to the biosphere, and doing so in the top journals, and for those tracking the field across the world and showing how rapidly this event is happening while we all clamor over COVID and climate change. Folks, we are in big trouble. For those who forget, the official science says that when she goes, she goes fast, a hundred times the mark used by NASA's 5% per century. Severely extreme. And by the way, that would be 5% lost per year, about 1% every 72 days. When she goes, it's going to be a couple years at most. That's not a joke. This is not a joke. At 5% loss per decade, we are now down 20% or more, and if Earth's magnetic field accelerates again, it is very bad news. And as many of you probably recall, it is very likely that it has accelerated again in the 2019 and 2020 geomagnetic jerk after the more regionally focused shift in 2017. Below this video, you will find a playlist, the playlist detailing what this cycle is on Earth, how terrible it has been in the past, and how we're due in the cycle timeline again, and what do you know, observational evidence of every kind indicates that fate appears unwilling to show mercy or alter her gait for the sake of our vanity. And she's at the front gates right now. And we are back to the end of December 2021. 
Here are the key works up to this point since the last postlude, just a couple of months ago. Let's ease into it with more geomagnetic biology. Add foraging struggles to the long list of insults to the biosphere amidst the ongoing and upcoming magnetic field event, with yet another confirmation of the criticality of field guidance for finding locations for reproduction. The puzzles of the Earth and stars continued with the revelation that the Earth can produce all the elements up to number 25, and in the same week that elemental synthesis in the cosmos was declared uncertain, with a vastly different view painted through a magnetic lens. The LLSVPs protruding from the core have sisters, and they were mapped as being the opposite character, in between the internal asymmetries on which we usually focus. They still love to blame a comet, and they keep having to add to the number of its fragments to account for the increasingly global character of the event and the evidence. We learned that in the biggest solar outburst, we might not get the waiting time of the CME impact. A big enough flare's X-rays would cause instant EMP conditions from its upper atmospheric effects, not at all unlike a nuclear detonation in the stratosphere, which would also cause an EMP at the surface. We learn more about how the interplanetary magnetic field and solar current sheet work the Earth's electromagnetic activity. We can translate that up to the Sun and the galactic current sheet scale, including yet another complete reversal of an electrodynamic microsystem due to such an interaction. All the discussion about the Taurus jet current sheet model continue to be confirmed, with the discovery of helical, DNA-shaped magnetic fields around a galactic jet, it's more evidence of the whole, the galactic magnetic system. We're moving on next to more confirmation of the variety of disasters that accompany the catastrophe cycle. The Heinrich and Dansgaard Oeschger cycles have been robustly confirmed, even going back as far as the event 60,000 years ago. And by that, I mean their synchronicity. Their alignment with the major climatological shifts got more evidence as well. These shifts make modern global warming look like nothing. We see how the 6,000-year cycle behavior is vastly different from the 1,500-year cycle effects, and this is, of course, due to those thresholds of forcing that tip heating into an ice-melt-cold climate bomb. And while seeing the pattern enough is enough to see the truth, it also helps when they are making great progress on the mechanisms of how and why these are synchronized, which is the point of the solar forcing of those cycles. The Heinrichs must follow because they're an extreme version of a DO event, one that crossed that threshold. Earth's magnetic field has continued to weaken, and we learned that while the North Pole may be moving faster, the South Polar region has gotten much weaker, largely because the South Pole has exited Antarctica already. I honestly didn't think we'd even get that first piece of evidence that the dust had arrived, but Parker delivered evidence that the corona of the sun is dustier than expected, and that's number two. We entered the holidays with two papers on the docket regarding the observational evidence of the radial nature of the galactic magnetic fields, just like the radial pattern we've scaled up from the solar system, and add on top of that the confirmation of what the community speculated all those months ago, that the Radcliffe wave is not isolated but part of a larger system, driven by that same structure that means such a scary thing for our star at the end of an age and the start of a new one. Hey folks, I've got three charts for you here. One easy, one intermediate, and one advanced level. If you pride yourself on having watched all the content and knowing the full scale of the catastrophe cycle, all of this should be familiar to you. A good test. And feel free to screenshot these for your sharing once you do feel you fully comprehend them. First is the weakening of the magnetic field. And the blue line shows how we got up to here and then a continuation with no further accelerations to the weakening field. The colorful breakout point is from right now. The red is where the ESA swarm manager told us we had about 100 to 200 years before he got fired. The yellow is a slow advance to that 5% per year mark we mentioned in that special video from about a week ago in this paper. The green shows the curve to approximately Doug Vogt's 2046 date, and the orange curve shows what happens if we basically shot to 5% field loss per year right now. My absolute best guess is that we will be somewhere around here, between the orange and the green lines. My best guess on the crescendo of the disaster. And of course, I do continue to insist you keep in mind that the bad stuff begins earlier, potentially years before, when the field gets too weak to protect our electrified way of life. That's well before the crescendo. The second chart is one I've talked about updating a fair bit, almost a year now. 
most notably in the inclusion of the next to last column on the right, finally got it in there, whether or not the early effects would be seen. Now for veterans, you have likely seen this chart before and its purpose is to show how the combination of the galactic current sheet and the punctuation of the solar micronova is the only way to explain all the evidence that seems to come at the same time every cycle. That new column is specifically for the effects we're tracking now, which would really only be seen with a magnetic excursion and the micronova scenario. The magnetic excursion only scenario actually fails as well when you realize it wouldn't be affecting the other planets. Dr. Paul LaViolette himself suggested there is no pregame to his superwave. When it arrives, it's all over. This leaves only one option to include that crescendo and everything we're tracking up to it. That option is in blue. But speaking of the other planets, and all the things changing right now. Forget the past for a moment and let's focus on the now. This chart compiles all the key Earth changes in red, the other planets, the Sun and interplanetary space in yellow, and the other stars nearby in blue. I highly suggest you look through this and see if there is any part of it on which you don't feel solid. These three charts we saw here are among dozens that could be used in catastrophism, but they're also a very good progression of a simple and understandable curve on a chart up to what happens each cycle and what we are dealing with now. And then finally here, to all the evidence that it's happening again. For the most part, you are all here for the same reason. You have something in common. Despite various anxieties over changes on the earth or risks from the sun, and despite your hopes ranging from sustained calm to let's just get it over already, you all recognize and are curious to know more about and follow these changes as they relate to our way of life and our interaction with the planet, the sun, the galaxy, and beyond. It turns out, there are some people you've probably heard of who have something in common with you. Most of the time when I discuss individuals of varying celebrity, I'm making fun of something they've said. And when I'm being more serious, the chorus rises in the comment section that I should avoid politics or culture. Please. If you haven't been under a rock the last few years, you know this isn't politics. It's Agenda 21, the 30-30 plan, the new Green Deal, and the taking control of the world. This is our lives. When it's Bill Maher repeatedly having the stones to call out his own side for being hypocritical bad faith frauds, it's time to look in the mirror. When this lady implies that the false veil of public propaganda messaging is real and then stands her ground, crushing her opposition, I get butterflies. Are you seeing what I'm seeing? Today. I don't want to focus on the geopolitical revolt ongoing among literally everyone with a brain. I want to discuss the ones who have the prepping mind, eyes open mentality that brings you back here for the series, daily updates, and documentaries. Hopefully, we all recall the disaster plan of the world's richest man, Jeff Bezos, hollowing out a mountain right next to his launch facility in West Texas. The Sierra Diablos probably are going to fare quite well in the upcoming cyclical disaster, but if they don't, he can go up or down. I don't buy this tunnel stuff any more than the thousands of you who have publicly speculated about why Musk is so darn interested in digging down and going up. This is his, remember. If you didn't know that the rich are prepping, hope you enjoyed the ignorant bliss. Many are more ready and plan to stay steady than most people think about, and the number of celebrities with disaster prep is growing too. Zoe Deschanel has it ingrained in her. You can tell. George Clooney and his elite lawyer wife have more than fancy paintings in their residence, and the same goes for Lady Gaga. And Post Malone, free shout out for Spencer Confidential on Netflix. Yeah, I watch stuff too. If you survive a catastrophe near Rhonda's residence, you should expect her to meet you in the aftermath and then pound your face in. But today, we're on to the Kardashians, and the last couple days, I have been keeping up. Some of you may have heard about her recent construction problems. Her neighbor basically claims she is building a bunker or vault underground. She says it's basically just an underground wellness area. If you saw her interest in survival bunkers a few months ago and it's hard for you to now buy that this isn't exactly the very same thing, then we have something in common. I just want to remind everyone that while the best possible evidence is the observational science and the ability to predict what happens next, when you see the celebrities turning on the powers that be, and when you see so many billionaires and celebrities taking actions that fall relatively in line with what you would do if you had their money and knew the science, the appropriate reaction 
is to come back to that mirror, look yourself in the eyes, and know you are on point. It's time to keep our heads up, eyes open, and to use these signals of all kinds to inform our attention and action rather than a fear reaction. I'll see you in the morning for the daily update on all those secret little things you have in common with billionaires, celebrities, and secretive government organizations. Be safe, everyone. That same sort of luck that will leave survivors worldwide, afar from tsunamis and volcanoes and ice storms, will be the same sort of luck made for people by themselves by being prepared and getting that head start. In terms of best chance to prolong your use of these devices, don't rely on batteries. Find a small solar panel, portable, with USB output, and get devices that have USB charging capability. There's no reason you might not be able to use those devices for a long time. Hmm, a long time. Yes, then there is the long haul. Provided we aren't all whisked underground into an unimaginable catacomb beneath us in the greatest feat of engineering in history, there is no reason you cannot do what your ancestors did. You may not live that way now, and you may be dependent on electricity, but the fact that we know how they lived back then means we have the tools at our fingertips in the age of information, how convenient it would rise before the fall. Here is a bit more on the intellectual side of prepping, but from a non-tangible perspective, a scene from one of the episodes preceding this infomentary. This event would be extreme. You can survive it, but the shock and awe to the circuitry inside is real. If you've ever seen someone in legitimate shock, you know that. That cannot be you if your children are depending on you. This fortress must be ready. A key aspect of mental practice is informational. Situational awareness is key and as example, I'll use New Mexico, where I live. Good to know where the waterways are, especially in a desert. Even a small stream nearby can be a bounty. If you know about local elevation, that helps too, especially in relation to ocean proximity, snow caps, or other temperature change between peak and canyon at the same latitude. Other sites to know, and everyone knows Carlsbad Caverns around here, so maybe some others might make your list. Certainly the mining operation maps of your local area could be good in case you need to flee cosmic plasma or into the warmer rock of the crust. And for the same reason, the cavern systems of your area are good things to know as well. It is critical that you apply these basic principles to your own situation, for your own awareness, to mitigate the system shock of the event. There is no real way to prepare for what terrified our ancestors, what glazed the moon, and which may happen again. But you simply don't have time to think about these things at that moment. It is as important to understand them now as it is to stock food, water, and seeds. So what are the two key aspects to mental prepping here of the non-tangible nature? First, this event will be shocking, but even knowing what could be coming gives you a heads up on the completely uninformed. Strength is key in those moments when courage is the most elusive. Second, some of you will want to bug out to safe locations, others will want to stay in your castle with all your supplies. That decision cannot be made on the fly. You don't have time to plot a route or figure out if you're staying or going. You don't have time to go get those books at the store. You have to have a certain amount of mental prepping done beforehand. 